Uh, but if you use those AI programs in order to um, turn people into stupid guinea pigs running on a treadmill, um, continue to consume things that they neither need nor, they want, nor want, creating environmental destruction, all for the bottom line of Amazon, um, then I have a problem. It's a question of democratic control of our technologies. Hello everyone, my name is Stephen Parton and you are listening to The Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio, where I keep you up to date on the latest technological trends and how they're impacting the transformation of consciousness and culture. This week my guest is Giannis Varoufakis, a Greek economist and politician. One thing Giannis is well known for is being the acting Minister of Finance in Greece during their debt crisis in 2015, and since then he also founded the political party Mira25. And he now sits in the Greek parliament as a member of that party. Aside from his work in government, Giannis also has extensive experience with the role that technology plays in the economic sphere, which includes researching virtual economies at Valve, which is one of the world's largest gaming companies. And he has even put forth plans for blockchain-based payment systems in Greece. While we certainly discuss some of the larger implications that tech has on economic structures, much of our conversation focuses on his concerns for what Giannis calls techno-feudalism, which he basically describes as the potential death of democratic capitalism at the hands of the tech elite. Now, a quick note that the connection between the west coast of America and Athens, Greece, resulted in some minor connection issues in the call. So if you notice some minor glitches in the audio here and there, don't worry, your device is working just fine. But with that out of the way, let's jump into it. Everyone, please welcome to the feedback loop, Giannis Varoufakis. All right then, sounds good, man. So I thought the best place to start before we get too deep into things is just give people a description of what led up to this moment in the world of capitalism and what things are starting to change thanks to technology and the digital world. 2008. 2008 is going to prove, I have no doubt about that, uh, a pivotal moment Um, in the same way that my generation looked at 1929, even though I was born in 1961, but still I was born in the shadow of 1929 because the world changed in 1929. Nothing made sense after 1929 in terms that were conventional wisdom before 1929 with the Great Depression, the war economy, the bread and wood system, um, the techno structure, as John Kenneth Galbraith put it, uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, it was a different ball game after 1929. And I do, do believe that, you know, in 2008, we experienced my generations, our generations, 1929, and nothing, nothing is ever going to go back to how things were before 2008. Uh, so that was at the level of the of the of, of finance, of uh, the macroeconomy. Uh, but at the very same time, the technological changes that were already happening, they were happening seamlessly. Uh, with uh, the digital technologies, the computer, then the internet, Internet One, well before we got into Internet Two. Uh, this continuum of technological change, at some, t- at some point, like a river, converged with the events of 2008 to produce what I consider to be this great transformation of capitalism into something different, which I like to referred to as techno-feudalism. And, and, and to, to get right to the heart of where I think you would like me to, to get, um, I think that the, the two things have been transformed by technology in capitalism. Uh, if you look at the 1950s and 1960s, the rise of the conglomerates of, of what John Kenneth Galbraith referred to as the te- techno-structure, the, uh, the rise of the Uber firm, not Uber, but you know the mega firm, uh, and the, 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 the way in which managerialism took over the large corporations in the United States in particular. Um, 
two things happened during that period, which were driven by two new service sectors, two, two new professions. One was tailorism in the guts of the factory. That is the scientific in inverted commas organization of production uh, by managers that you know studied tailored methods. They went, they, they got their MBAs and so on. Uh, so a whole service sector, a whole profession, the purpose of which was to squeeze more productivity out of labor in the factory, on the shop floor, in the in the you know in sales, in uh, um, in the shopping malls, right? So that's one profession, and the second one. I use the Mad Men parable of Don Draper, you know, mm. the advertising executive type who finds creative ways of commodifying emotions in the advertising sector in order to make us, in order effectively to produce desire that didn't exist. So you have a production process, producing a production process that through tailored methods produces things, and a production process that produces manufactures the desire for the things. So that was happening well before 2008. What technology did was to create a new kind of capital, which lives in the cloud. I call it cloud capital. <laughs> uh, you can imagine why. Because what it does is it automates these two professions. The tailorist man manager on the shop floor, if you go to an Amazon warehouse, if you go to you know any factory producing laptops, you'll see that the, 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 the managerial aspect of the process has been automated. Now it's, it's algorithms that, that, that determine the pace of work of Uber workers, of Tesla workers, of, uh, you know, of Ford mm -hmm. motor, motor company workers. Uh, and at the very same time, Don Draper has been taken, taken over by an algorithm, um, a Facebook algorithm, a Google algorithm. So the combination of the financial crisis, which replaced private profit making with central bank minted money, which we still live under, on the one hand, and the technology which automated and subjected to an algorithm, the tailorist manager on the shop floor and Don Draper in the adver advertising industry, this combination effectively did to capitalism <laughs> that which 1991 did to communism. It effectively dealt a major blow at it, one from which I do not believe that capital can ever recover. And is that what is pushing us into what you call techno feudalism, where that cloud capital and that automated process has allowed for such a disparity of wealth generation that now we're entering into that feudal state? Well, yes, because it's not rocket science. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it's quite straightforward because if you think about it, 2008 destroyed one of the two pillars of capitalism, profitability. Mm. So up until 2008, even though capitalism underwent many transformations from Adam Smith, Baker, Brewer and Butcher, all the way to, you know, Thomas Edison, Westinghouse, uh, Ford Motor Company and so on, and so on General Electric, right? Huge transformation. But nevertheless, profits, private profits were always from the 18th century all the way to 2008, were the fuel that ran the system. From 2008 to this day, or to be precise, from 2009 to this day, it's central bank money, it's not profits. There is a complete disconnect between profitability and what drives the system. Mm -hmm. I mean, profits are important, but it's not what drives the system. So, you know, and, and, and in other words, there is state power, a very weak state, but nevertheless, that has the power to produce the money, the central bank money that runs the system. And of course, this means huge privileged access to that money by those who have access to the financial sector, because when the Fed prints money, you cannot get that money. It's only, you know, Citibank and Bank of America that can ha that have access to this money and they will not give it to you. They will pick up the phone and they, they will call Apple and they will call General Electric and ExxonMobil and say, do you want some of this money? And those companies will take this money mostly and not want to invest it in your jobs my jobs, you know, the jobs of the people watching us, they will take it to the stock exchange and buy back their own shares. Mm. So it's, it, it, this is, this is very, this is not capitalism. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that's, that's one thing that really makes a huge change. So the second thing is that, you know, this, what I call cloud capital has a capacity 
to, for the first time in the history of capitalism, to do something quite remarkable, to replenish itself without going through a market. Mm. Because think about it. Up until cloud capital was invented, capital was accumulating, replenishing itself, building up within some labor market. So, you know, Henry Ford employed mm -hmm. workers, workers produced cars, cars were sold. Part of the revenue, or as we left, is called surplus value, was retained by Henry Ford after having paid his bankers, his rent, you know, all the things he had to pay for. What was left was his profit. Then he invested it, or part of it, to more capital. So capital was reproduced within the factory, within the shop, within the workplace. But now, for the first time, yeah, you and I, whenever we walk around town and we carry our phone with us, you know, we replenish the capital stock of Google Maps. When we post photographs on TikTok or videos on TikTok and photographs on Instagram, we replenish, you know, cloud capital directly without being paid outside the labor market. So, you know, I call these all of us cloud serfs because mm -hmm. we are we're closer to feudalism. And also, if you think about it, and that's my the last point I'll make. Um, markets, there's this, you know, people talk about replacement. I, I'm, I'm worried about the great market replacement. Markets are being replaced by what most people call platforms. Uh, Amazon.com is not a market. It really is not a market. It, it's, a, it's a place where you buy and sell stuff, but it is not a market because if you think about it, the moment you enter Amazon.com, you exit capitalism. You enter, uh, it's a bit like stepping out of the building in which you are. Imagine a, science, a very third-rate science fiction movie. You, you step out and you realize that something has happened. And every building belongs to one person. Everything that is sold in every, all the shops is controlled by the algorithm that is controlled by one person, Jeff Bezos. Right? Um, it's a digital fiefdom. It's not a market. What you see, what you see, imagine walking down the street and recognizing that what you see is determined by the algorithm of that one person who decides what you see. If he doesn't want you to see it, you won't see it, ever. It doesn't exist for you. You and I are walking down the same street, looking at the same spot, and we see different things depending on what that one person wants us to see. Yeah. This is not capital. This is not the market. This is a fief, a fiefdom. It's a digital fiefdom. So if you take all the, the, those aspects, put them together, right? Um, you have something that, I don't think it's capitalism now. I mean, we could call it hyper-capitalism if we wanted, right? In the same way that in the end of the 20th, 18th century, instead of talking about capitalism, we could say, this, oh, this is still feudalism, but it is commodified market feudalism. But I think it was important historically to make the break, the conceptual break, that, you know what, no, this is not feudalism, something else which we will call capitalism, because capital has taken over from land as the main source of power. I think similarly, cloud capital is triumphing at, at the expense of capitalism. It is replacing profitability and it's replacing uh, markets. These are the two pillars of capitalism. How do we reconcile this or solve this? Is this something that needs to be addressed through regulation on capitalism? Something like, you know, stopping a monopolistic powers from coming to be when, you know, what we're describing in a lot of ways is this natural progression of technology using scale using optimized uh, automation a lot of this seems like it was inevitable so how do we take that inevitable aspect of technology and reconcile it with our desires for democratic capitalism i don't think that democratic capitalism is possible i don't think capitalism is possible i think capitalism has died this is a discussion you know this mm. this conversation I'm an old lefty, right? It reminds me of conversations that we leftists used to have in 1990 about how can we uh, save communism? We cannot. It's gone. That's it. Finished. Kaput. <laughs> Died. <laughs> Technology and society has um, overcome all the things that we take for granted. Um, when you say it's inevitable, technology is inevitable because of human curiosity, human creativity. You know, we, we have a remarkable capacity to produce te technological revolutions um, in spite of ourselves. <laughs> so, and that's a good thing. I, I'm, I'm, all, yeah. I'm a tech geek. I like technology. But it's not even inevitable that technology should emerge the way, evolve the way it has. Let me give you an example, right? Um, 
I'm old enough to remember Internet One. Hmm. Internet One in the 1970s, yes, well, okay, it was really very primitive and clunky. I, I still remember punching cards in order to interface uh, and sending batch files. But there was no email. Um, I'm that old. <laughs> um, okay, but still, it was a cooperative enterprise, right? I mean, all the protocols that we still have, I mean, Internet One is still alive. It's there, a bit hidden in our computers, you know. Um, HTTP, for instance, it's mm -hmm. still part of, of, of that original 1970s uh, commons. Internet, it was an Internet commons. Nobody had proprietorial rights over it. Um, and, you know, take GPS. This is an ex a be beautiful technology. It was developed by the Pentagon. And at some point, the Pentagon decided, okay, it will, they will make GPS available to everyone. Or Wi-Fi, for that matter. I don't know whether you know the history of Wi-Fi. It was a result of research at CSIRO, which is the state research laboratories in Australia. Mm. So they developed Wi-Fi, they developed the Pentagon divided GPS, and then they made it available to everyone. Right? So you don't have to pay to use GPS. You have direct link, you know, immediately you know where you are on the map. Okay. Now, Internet 2, which is based on the appropriation of your identity, your digital identity, by big tech. Now, this is a big thing. It didn't have to happen that way. Yeah. It, 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 it's quite preposterous that you and I do not own our digital identity. Our digital identity is fragmented, and it is owned by different corporations. So if I want to prove who I am, I have to beg my bank <laughs> to share my digital identity with somebody else who, who will then know that it's me, um, or, you know, Facebook, who knows who my friends are, or Spotify, who knows what music I like, or, you know, I do not have all my, the parts of my digital identity in one wallet, in a private wallet. I don't have that, right? I mean, Web3 promises to do this. I don't think they can deliver it. But this was a political decision. This was, there was yeah. nothing inevitable about that. Some really powerful people managed to steal our digital identity from us and to create a huge business in, in the sense of selling us the right to prove who we are. Now, that is a political decision. It has nothing to do with technological evolution. All right? So I don't believe that, that you... By the way, I do not believe you can regulate this. You know, it's not like breaking up Standard Oil, which is what Theodore Roosevelt did a century ago. Uh, how do you break up um, Facebook? Yeah. I mean, you, ju you just can't. I mean, even those who say you take WhatsApp out of Facebook. Well, WhatsApp will, will simply go bust if you take it out of Facebook because it has no business model, right? <laughs> it's yeah. only there in order to bolster Facebook. Facebook, the whole point about Facebook is that it is unitary. If you break it up, then the, you kill it, you destroy it. What do you do with Google? How do you, you know? Um, so I do have ideas which are very radical. But they yeah. are not, they're too they're much more radical than simply regulating. Let's talk about them. I'd love to hear these radical ideas. Is this, are you talking about <laughs> ideas that you put forth in your book, Another Now, or are you talking about even more radical ideas? So imagine a situation where, you know, you're a higher company, any, any company, the company you work for, any other company. And it's like entering college when you enroll and you get a library card. This library card allows you to book, get books out of the library, to to use the, the computer facilities of the university, um, you know, to go to go to concerts, whatever, to vote in student union selections and so on. Um, but you can't sell it. You can't lease it. You cannot um, leverage it. <laughs> you have it. And then when you're not in college anymore, you give it back. Mm. It ceases to be valid. Imagine if shares were like that. Imagine the huge transformation of corporations. Yeah. You would still have market-based corporations, but you would not have a stock exchange because you know, shares would not be tradable. Uh, large companies will decide, let's take General Electric. The owners of General Electric would be the people who work there. You know, suddenly, they would, they would want to downsize the company. Uh, they would like you know, the unit that makes jet engines to spin off uh, to create its own thing, another unit to create its own thing, because it will be m much more manageable. And now with uh, digital technologies, it's much easier, much, much easier, uh, you know, to have shareholders meetings 
with delegation, with uh, consultation, with deliberation, so that much better decisions can be made by those uh, now new shareholders who are actually the people who know the company best because they work in it. So, you know, if Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, who are very smart people, much smarter than I am, you can check their bank account and compare it to mine. Um, if they want to, um, if, 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 they, if they are so smart and the rest of us who work with them and for them and in the company, eh, if we want to take their advice, yeah, of course we can. But they would have however to persuade us. At the moment, they don't. At the moment, they simply have a block vote <laughs> together with institutional investors, which, mean, which means that whatever they, de they decide goes, mm -hmm. however clever or stupid. So, you know, suddenly, you see, this is a quite libertarian, but also left-wing perspective in the sense that you turn companies effectively into cooperatives, you have self-regulation, and you don't have the state meddling with the business. It's on, you don't have the, the, you know, the senator or the governor or the, the, the treasury secretary or whoever, or the president coming to you and telling you, you know, your company is too big, or you should be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. It happens organically. So, you know, I, in another now, I tell a story of how that could be. And what do you think the role of other technologies are in this transformation? You mentioned that <clears throat> technology is going to help this transformation now. Do you think it's going to require things like cryptocurrencies, which I know you've been critical of, or artificial intelligence, forms of automation? Are these kind of technological innovations going to be necessary to bring us into that new paradigm that you're talking about in another now, or a new paradigm that you'd like to have us actually end up in? I love artificial intelligence. I'm not critical of artificial intelligence. I'm critical of its uses. Mm. Like, you know, all technologies, you know, you can have from the age of iron. <laughs> you could use iron to create plows or to, you know, construct beautiful temples like a partner, or you can use it in order to kill people, right? So it's not the technology problem. It's who owns it <laughs> and what do they use it for? So there are, as you know, uh, there are artificial intelligence uh, programs today, which, uh, you know, uh, are marvels of ingenuity in the sense that they, they, they map out the proteins of superbugs that no antibiotic can kill, and they design on their own antibiotics that can kill them. You know, I, I, I bow with uh, uh, in, in, huge amounts of um, respect for the people who designed those AI programs, right? Uh, but if you use those AI programs in order to create drones that, um, you know, can enter a building, use face recognition, decide whom to kill and whom not to kill autonomously, then I have a problem, right? Yeah. Well, when it's used by, you know, Facebook or um, Amazon in order to um, turn people into stupid guinea pigs running on a treadmill, um, continue to consume things that they neither need nor, they want, nor want, creating environmental destruction, all for the bottom line of Amazon, um, then I have a problem. It's a question of democratic control of our technologies. And similarly with blockchain, I mean, I'm, I think that Bitcoin is a crazy, a silly idea. But I think that blockchain can be extremely useful when it mm. comes to organizing uh, common ledgers, um, distributed common ledgers, or when it comes to uh, uh, replacing top-down hierarchical systems of keeping records. Um, so it's a question of how you use the technologies that the present is churning out. Yeah, you, you mentioned there um, the exploitative exploitation of, of tech companies. And there's a specific line you've said somewhere in an interview, I believe, but you said the rise of crypto applications will only make our society more oligarchic, exploitive, irrational, and inhuman. Typically, when people think of cryptocurrencies, they're, they're thinking of third world countries that are able to stand on their own now because they're not using their failing currency or people you know, creating an alternative to capitalism. Why is this not true? What is it about cryptocurrencies that fails us? Because it's not true. It is yeah. not. Look at the catastrophe in El Salvador with that idiotic president who adopted Bitcoin. Look, I understand why people hate governments. I understand why they hate central banks. I understand why they hate the exorbitant privilege of the dollar, of the Fed, or the European Central Bank. I mean, I made a career out of fighting the European Central Bank. But... Folks, there is no escaping 
political money. Money is and can only be political. So why is Bitcoin helpful to the people of El Salvador? If you're a poor El Salvadorian, okay, you have a president who says, okay, Bitcoin is legal tender. Why do you give it down? Okay, you don't have any, you do not own any Bitcoin. You do not have the capacity to mine it. I mean, who can these days? I mean, it, yeah. it costs the earth to mine anything. Okay, so you need dollars in order to exchange it for Bitcoin. And then once you do that, then your dollar value may go up or down like a yo-yo. This is ridiculous. It, so it doesn't help third world countries at all. Yeah. You know who has been helped by, by Bitcoin? And this is not insignificant. My great friend, Julian Ange, I'm... Julian is a personal friend of mine, mm -hmm. and, and you know, where communism is support. You know, when he published information, as we all know, that uh, humiliated the president because of the war crimes that uh, they depict, the, 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 those videos depicted carried mm -hmm. out by the states in Iraq and Afghanistan and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. The first thing that happened is Visa and Mars stopped financing, finance, transferring people to donate to WikiLeaks. He went into Bitcoin. Okay. I'm glad about Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is irrelevant mm. to the vast majority of people out there. And let's face it, nobody buys anything with Bitcoin. It's, it's a tulip. It's a tulip. If its price goes up, and you good on you. You made a lot of money. If it goes down, you've lost it. You're a fool. You should never buy Bitcoin with money that you need, yeah. ever. In the same way, you should never go to the races to bet on a horse, money that you need. If you do, you're an idiot. You should not be doing this. But blockchain is hugely, I mean, it's, it's a solution to a problem we have not discovered yet or to mm. a series of problems. We know many problems that are being helped. I mean, I, I for instance, you know, when I was in the Ministry of Finance, I was um, planning, because, you know, here in Greece, we are part of the Eurozone. So effectively, we have no monetary independence. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, we, we share a foreign currency. A currency we cannot print. It's you know it's crazy, but that's, that's the situation. And we were in the middle middle of a banking crisis, a financial crisis, an economic crisis. And I was very keen to create um, additional liquidity and a payment system that would not depend on a foreign central bank centered in Frankfurt. So um, I was planning, and that's one of the reasons why these people in in Brussels and Frankfurt and Berlin hated me with a passion was because I was planning a payment system that would be based on blockchain, which would be euro denominated and would be backed by Greek taxes. Mm. So there are good things you can do with blockchain. The idea that you're going to replace money with um, a pie in the sky, a political gold-like yeah. you know, digital thing, that is a dangerous fantasy. What are, what are your thoughts on something like basic income as we look forward? Is that something that technology can help us create? And is, is universal basic income something that you would support? Oh, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on record supporting UBI. On one condition, that mm -hmm. it is not financed through taxation. Because, mm. you know, if you go to a blue-collar worker somewhere in uh, Indiana or uh, Minnesota and you, or Wisconsin, and you say to them, okay... Uh, you're killing yourself working <laughs> in a factory, in a warehouse, uh, Walmart, wherever you we are working. And we're going to take a, a cut of your money uh, in the form of federal or state taxes. And we're going to um, pay people to do nothing and watch television or rich people for that mm -hmm. matter huh? or surface in, uh, in California. Uh, you've lost them. They will look at you as, a, as, as public enemy number one. Rightly so. Right? So I don't believe in tax-funded basic income. But I believe in a crypto digital currency issued by the Fed in your country, the ECB here in Europe, in the Bank of Japan, and whatever. Right? Um, imagine if we all had a digital wallet with a sense, which can happen tomorrow, by the way, right? in, um, technologically. It is really very easy, <laughs> extremely <laughs> exceptional. Uh, we all have the digital wallet that allows to trade with one another, to transact with one another um, free. No bank fees. 
then there's nothing stopping the Fed a certain amount of credits to its digital wallet, flat, horizontally, same to everybody. That's a basic income. Mm -hmm. uh, and by adjusting it up or down, you can actually control for the rates of inflation a lot more eff effect effectively than what the Fed does. Because think about it, you know, I, today we have a problem with inflation. But as, up until a year ago, we had a problem with deflation. You know, the Fed in the United States, the ECB in Europe, they were struggling to create inflation. They couldn't. They were printing and printing and printing as if there's no tomorrow, and there was no inflation. Okay, why? Because it was going all through. The printed money was given to the to Wall Street. Wall mm -hmm. Street was channeling it to the financial sector. You had asset price inflation. Nothing, you know, no, no stimulation of the economy. Now you have the opposite. You have too much inflation, right? And the Fed doesn't know what to do about it. You know, if they increase interest rates to three, four percent then half of the world is going to go bankrupt, the ones who are, have borrowed in US dollars. And then that would create a huge recession, which is going, you know, is going to sting the United States. Yeah. Um, but if you had, if we all had digital wallets in our jurisdiction, right, all residents of a jurisdiction, then the basic income could adjust, you know, go up, go up and down uh, in order to control for prices much more effectively and provide a basic income. So the technology is is the solu is is a problem, but it's also the solution. I, I, I've been a big advocate for UBI for a long time, but I've never been quite able to understand how we could create all that wealth for people and then not have the market just respond by increasing their prices to account for that wealth. Well, I think for twelve years they were printing money as if there's no tomorrow, and there was no inflation. So don't assume you know the quantity theory of money that people like Milton Friedman and so on popularized. Um, is based the idea that is that that prices are proportional to the quantity of money. So if you if you produce more money because you are paying people's basic income, then prices will go up. Well, this is predicated on a false assumption, and the assumption is that the quantity of goods produced and investments made is fixed. If it were fixed, and you had the same amount of goods, and then there's more money chasing it, yes, of course, prices will go up. But if you have um, excess capacity and underinvestment, a basic income that is cleverly targeted together with other policies, monetary policies, to expand capacity, to create investment in things and goods that didn't exist before. And you have a proportional increase in the quantity of goods and the quantity of investment goods which is proportional to the quantity of money that increases, then you have st price stability. And so let me give you an example. I mean, people ask me, what, what would I do if I were, you know, at the Fed, running the Fed or the ECB? My advice to central banks is um, to do three things all at once. Uh, first, increase interest rates quickly because we have high inflation rate. So arrest it. Put it up to 3%. Today, don't wait. Don't you know, these incremental you know, twenty-five basis points, fifty basis points. Just go for it. You know you will. You want to go to three percent, three and a half percent. Go to it today, right? Today. In any case, businesses are not paying three percent. They are paying six and seven percent. Uh, it's only the big sharks who pay the lower interest rates. Why should we feed money to the big sharks who are creating bubbles and not creating wealth? Mm. So that's the first thing I would do. The second thing I would do is I would continue to. Uh, print money in the form of basic income to support those who cannot put food on the table as, as, we, as we speak or pay for their electricity bill or for a fuel. Uh, and, and at the same time, fund green energy. And if you fund only green energy, what you're doing is reducing the long-term costs of everybody. So this is deflationary, not inflationary. Because we need to win ourselves off fossil fuels. We know that. Well, yeah. print the money and do it. You know, instead of printing the money as as they have been doing to give to every every financier on earth, just you know produce the the, the 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 facilities for green energy that will reduce the cost of doing business for everyone. And on top of that, I would have I would haircut debts, because one of the big problems that central banks have is after 13 years of zombifying many companies, you know, keeping them alive. Keeping, keeping non-viable companies alive 
and states for that matter here in Europe, like my state, you know, the Greek state or the Italian yeah. state, were completely unviable. So what they're doing is they keep printing money to, to, to pretend, to extend and pretend the uh, unpayable debts of conglomerates and states. Restructure the debts, cut them. <laughs> if a debt cannot be repaid, there's no point in printing money to pretend that it is being repaid. Cut right. it, haircut right. it. And, you know, I do believe that creditors must learn to take hits. Because, you know, people say, oh, but a debt is a debt is a debt. No, it's not. The whole point of capitalism is that the debt is not sacred. That, you know, if you, if you lend somebody money that they cannot repay, you know, half of the shame is his and half of the shame is yours. You should have been careful what, what you do with your money. Mm. Take hits. Since 2008, um, Obama, and then after the Obama, uh, Trump as well, uh, and now Biden, they are extending and pretending. They are doing everything they can so that Wall Street doesn't hate, take a hit. Let, mm. let them take a hit. As we wrap up here and you know respect your time, what can the average person do? What is something tangible that the average pe- people of the world can do to help move us closer to this world, despite you know having such so, so much governmental power and wealth levied against us? There's no alternative to democratic politics. You know, yeah. um, Oscar Wilde was absolutely right when he said that socialism was never going to happen because we are all going to be bored to tears with the meetings of the socialists that take forever. You know, town hall meetings, organizing in communities, political. I know I set up in my old age a political party here in Greece and now we're in parliament. It's mind numbingly boring. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I wish I was doing other things. But there's no alternative to democratic politics. Democracy is not a luxury. It's essential. We are going to decide the future of the world through the way we manage our democracies. And we cannot subcontract democracy to some political party that will solve problems for us. Because if you do that, they will only work for themselves (laughs) and for the vested interests that will capture them. Um, I'm afraid, folks, You've got to do some hard work. Get out there and organize. And have a view about everything. Which means you have a duty to be informed first. Mm. Well, if there's a renaissance of democracy that's going to take place anywhere, it seems like Greece is a good place for it to happen. I want to thank you for your time, man. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much.